Recording this program is entirely fictional and made by a sole Canadian man. All characters and events in the show, including the host, even those that are based on real people, are entirely fictional. The following program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. America. The land of the free. Home of the brave. And the stupid. And the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets, causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight on Grand Theft Autobiographies. Mothers, Murder, and the Mafia. Tonight we will examine the criminal career of one of Liberty City's most accomplished wise guys. We will get a glimpse at the city during the height of Mafia violence and some of the degenerate lowlifes responsible for carving up this once beautiful urban American settlement into a nice big homemade Italian pie. In this quintessential American tale, we will examine a man who near single-handedly kept his organization afloat using any means necessary and had a significant hand in shaping the landscape of organized crime that remains in Liberty City to this day, Tony Cipriani. This episode of Grand Theft Autobiographies brought to you by... Pad Radio. Radio. Music that our demographic research says will put you in the mood to buy things. Radio. St. Mark's, Liberty City. The model for Little Italy districts across the country. Sloped terraces, fine dining, and the ever-present loom of organized crime. This is where the story of tonight's subject begins, and possibly ends. In many ways, similar to another mafioso we've covered on this series, the life of Tony Cipriani is a traditionally American one. The son of second-generation Italian immigrants, Cipriani was born and raised in St. Mark's by his overbearing Italian mother and gangster father, likely sometime in the early 60s. That gangster lifestyle wouldn't take long to catch up to the Cipriani patriarch, however, as he was killed by warring triad gang members when Tony was still fairly young. Perhaps initially interested in seeking revenge, or motivated by a desire to impress his unpleasable mother, Tony would follow in his old man's footsteps, and soon after, take up a life of organized crime, working with the Leone family. The details of Tony's early years in the mob are sparse, but things become clearer by 1994, when Tony leaves Liberty to lie low after carrying out a dangerous hit on a made man for the Leones. It isn't clear where exactly Cipriani fled to, but four years later, he returned to a now calmer Portland, under orders from Don Salvatore himself. Though he'd performed a service that Salvatore considered invaluable, Tony's long absence forced the Don to strip Cipriani of his rank to allow for an uninterrupted flow of cash into the family. During this time, an up-and-coming wise guy named Vincenzo Lucky Chile had risen to the position of Salvatore's right-hand man, a job that Tony had been vying for before his forced departure. And the relationship would only become further poisoned, with Vincenzo taking every opportunity to exercise authority over the otherwise senior soldier. I got you a nice little place to stay, Tony. It's got you written all over it. We'll head there first. You're all heart. Insulted but still loyal, Tony would briefly work under Vinny as a low-level goon once again, until Lucky's jealousy got the better of him. Vincenzo would send Cipriani to pick up a vehicle for him, only unbeknownst to Tony, the car was being washed by the LCPD. Through sheer dumb luck or expert driving, Tony would escape from the authorities and take his boss's banshee to the car crusher in Harwood to send a message that he would no longer be pushed around. Well look, I was making scores while you were looking up girls' skirts. Have your bitch job back, Just boss! I quit! Tony, you're making a bitch? JT, 
okay, you little sicko. Get the fuck out of here before I come in here and break your legs. While feuding with Vincenzo, Tony would also begin working with Sindaco family turncoat Joseph Daniel J.D. O'Toole, who ran the Sindaco-controlled club Polly's Review Bar in Portland's Red Light District. A deviant who was already in debt to Tony, J.D. would express interest in changing families, citing dissatisfaction with Sindaco leadership, something the Leones were all too happy to oblige him in, at least as long as he remained useful. Tony would work with O'Toole to sabotage the Sindaco family operations in Portland and protect Leone assets defending a Leone-owned casino in St. Mark's from an attempted bombing, and retaliating by personally destroying Sindaco Club The Doll's House. All while dealing with Salvatore's kleptomaniac wife, Maria Latour, who was developing an obsession with her husband's new muscle, and Tony's own psychotic mother, perpetually unimpressed with her son's position in the family. That might be a bit funny but it takes guts to snub a Cipriani. Maria would eventually cut ties with Tony once she learned of his dire financial straits, and Tony's mother would call a hit out on her own son, shamed by what she perceived as his lack of motivation to move up in his organization. I've called a hit on you. It's really the only way I for you. What? Ma? You were always a disobedient fool. Despite attempting to prove to his mother his worthiness, going as far as to butcher a man she considered more impressive than him that Tony caught wearing an adult diaper in the woods near Callahan Point, nothing would prove to be enough for Ma Cipriani. Is this how you spend your time? Sneaking around in the woods, taking pictures of men? What is wrong with you, Antonio? You shame me. Tony would survive the initial wave of Hitman and be forced to watch his back going forward, whilst continuing to try and regain his reputation to prove his mother wrong. Your mother is a lucky woman. So I hear. If dealing with a developing mob war wasn't enough, Tony would also be responsible for sorting out a dispute at the Portland docks, when ferry union boss Jane Hopper initiated a strike and halted all traffic in and out of the port. Tony would first attempt direct bribery on Hopper, but when it failed, he instead bribed the ferry workers themselves by providing them with prostitutes. Cipriani would ultimately end the strike after intimidating the other union bosses and bullying Hopper into submission. He would presumably kill and impersonate her chauffeur and use a lengthy and dangerous joyride through Harwood to finally put an end to her interference in Leone affairs. Tony would soon after participate in an on-foot deal with the Colombian cartel, where he nearly killed future underboss Miguel after the meeting was ambushed by the FBI and LCPD. Meanwhile, tensions on disputed territory between the Leones and Sindacos continued to escalate. Salvatore is nearly crushed to death after being kidnapped at Polly's Review Bar under orders from the invisible Don Polly Sindaco himself, and narrowly rescued by Tony. In retaliation, Tony and Salvatore personally ignited open street warfare with the Sindaco soldiers in the Red Light District. It was during this time, Tony was first made aware of a new potential foe by JD, the Sicilian Mafia. Tony would learn from JD that a high-ranking Sicilian named Massimo Torini was flying into Liberty City intent on brokering a treaty between the three families. Ever distrustful, Salvatore would have Tony follow Torini's helicopter as he made several stops around the city, first with the Diablos of Hepburn Heights, and then the triads of Chinatown, before Tony was spotted and Massimo fled. Following the bloodshed in red light, Leones would take outright control of Polly's review bar, and with it no longer a source of information, it fell to Tony and rising soldier Mickey to deal with the former owner, now a liability. Uh, where's Salvatore? Tony, the first drink's on me. Hey, the guy was a fucking rat. He screwed over his own boss. This scratch yard. Salvatore could never trust that motherfucker. The club would soon after be given to made man Luigi Gattarelli and be renamed Luigi's Sex Club 7. With their territory and red light held, things seemed to be looking up for Tony temporarily, when surprisingly, Tony was contacted again by Vincenzo Chile, seemingly interested in reconciliation for the sake of business. Either out of an intense naivete, or more likely, an obligation to their shared senior employer, Tony would make his way to the freighter in Atlantic Keys where Vinny claimed to be waiting, and what happened next, our anonymous sources swear is true, no matter how unhinged it may seem.
I'm gonna cut you up, little man! Is that dumbass Jim dead yet? Hate to disappoint you, Vinny. You son of a bitch! Why can't you just die already? You should have never come back, Tony. I worked my fingers to the bone for Salvatore, and you just come wandering back to town, and he's all Tony this and Tony that. This is my town, Tony! My town! You ain't taking it away from me! I'm gonna enjoy this. Not an easy man to kill. Tony would single-handedly fight off Vincenzo's goons, and then turn his attention to Lucky himself. Though it is the opinion of this reporter that Mr. Chile likely didn't feel all too lucky in those last moments. Not so lucky at all. To make matters even worse, not long after surviving the attack, the Oni Turk would fall under attack once again, this time by Diablos of Hepburn Heights, likely spurred on and armed by the meddling Sicilians. The open violence would get so bad that Salvatore began to suspect the current mayor, Roger C. Hull, in the pocket of Don Franco Ferrelli, would pin the blame exclusively on the Leones. After an incident where Salvatore's paranoia leads him to nearly shoot Tony, the two would attempt to make their way to Staunton Island by the now open ferry routes, but be stopped by an LCPD blockade. His suspicions confirmed, Tony and Sal would flee the authorities and make a dangerous leap across the incomplete Callahan Bridge and escape to a Leone safe house in Newport. Yeah, this is the place. I'm gonna take a look around, see what's what. I might see you here later. Looking to turn the tide of pressure being applied to his organization, Salvatore would concoct a plan to establish a Leone-backed candidate, Donald Love, as the new mayor of Liberty, which first meant the old mayor had to go. Tony would personally carry out the task of assassinating Roger Hole whilst on his daily jog through Belleville Park, and with his death, finally earn the title of made man in the Leone crime family, and even earn the respect of his mother, who called off the hit she'd put on her son weeks earlier. What are you waiting for? Tony, my boy, today's the day you're being made. Oh, Salvatore, I miss the Leone. Our mom has been waiting for this day. With a vacant seat in City Hall, a by-election would be triggered, and competing with Donald Love, despite his previous two election attempts failing, would be Miles O'Donovan. Tony would begin working with Love to swing the election in his favor, personally driving an election van and denouncing the policies of O'Donovan, O'Donovan hates America, killing some of his campaigners, and burning down a Ferrelli-controlled warehouse filled with voting machines, which Donald suspected the Ferrellis intended to rig against them. Despite initial reservations, Donald would even have Tony outright steal uncounted votes from couriers in a last-ditch effort to win, as the election swung further towards O'Donovan. What was that you said about vote rigging? No, oh, shut up! Desperate to know how the O'Donovan campaign learned of the Leone connection to love, Salvatore and Tony would interrogate the mayor's assistant and learn of the hovering influence the Sicilian Mafia was exercising. The Sicilians had been watching the growing conflict like buzzards, prepared to strike when fighting ceased. They'd made deals with other gangs in the cities, including the Triads and Diablos, to stoke battles for Mafia territory further escalating the drain on each family already actively at war with each other. Whilst the Sicilians were claiming to back the Ferrellis in the conflict, the plan was to have the Sindaco Leone and Ferrelli families all fight each other to annihilation, allowing the Sicilians to move in and take control of the entire city. Confident Leones could themselves capitalize on the chaos of the war, but only if the fighting remained even, Salvatore would escalate tensions with the Ferrellis by having Tony remote control Polly Sindaco's car during a meeting between high-ranking members of the Sindaco and Ferrelli families. Tony would also silence a Ferrelli wise guy who learned the truth about the Sicilian's influence in order to maintain the ruse and continue reaping the benefits of a Sindaco Ferrelli war. Seeking to inflame the situation, Tony would also begin working with corrupted LCPD detective Leon McCaffrey. McCaffrey would assist Tony in massacring Sindaco soldiers in a chase across town, slaughtering Ferrelli men with a katana in Belleville Park, and working with the uptown Yardies kill more Ferrelli foot soldiers, before defending them in turn from a Sindaco attack. 
During this time, perhaps guilty from his numerous crimes, Tony would also visit the church in downtown Staunton to confess his sins. His gullibility, accentuated by his faith, allowed Tony to perform various tasks for the man in the confessional, including stealing a report, stealing diamonds that had already been stolen once before, rampaging with a fire truck through the streets of Bedford Point, and killing three celebrities, DBP, Black Lightman, and Faith W. Upon successfully murdering the rising stars, the phony father would run out on Cipriani, who soon after learned the man's true identity was Ned Burner, LCN reporter, and that he'd simply been using Tony to write headlining stories about each of Tony's missions. To add insult to injury, it wasn't long after Cipriani's dealing with Burner when he received word from Donald Love about evidence linking him to the Leone crime family. Despite Tony's efforts in retrieving the evidence, it would prove to not be enough when reports on the connection pushed the vote squarely to O'Donovan's corner. Having dumped nearly all his finances into the campaign, the loss and resulting scandal would bankrupt Love, who put the blame directly on Cipriani's shoulders. You got no more links to organized crime. You're whiter than white. You could be the Pope. <laughs> the Pope. Watch this. Although no links can be proved between Donald Love and Liberty City's organized crime, it seems his friendship with mobsters, including Tony Cipriani, have counted heavily against him in voters' eyes. The past few hours have seen his popularity plummet. He is deemed, it seems, unfit for office. Unfit? Because of you. Yeah, and it's all your fault. My fault? Oh, yeah. My fault. <laughs> I can't believe the sacrifices I've made for this town. And do you know what my weakness has been the entire time? Humility. <laughs> and now I'm ruined, bankrupt. Twenty million dollars in the hole. Gone. Bankrupt. Done. Arrivederci. Bankrupt! With O'Donovan in the mayor's seat, Salvatore would finally be arrested and taken to a jail in Shoreside Vale. Not prepared to give up, Salvatore would have Tony meet with him in jail, posing as his lawyer in order to continue planning their pushback against their enemies. Uh, you got five minutes. With the aid of the South Side Hoods, Tony would kill dozens of Pirelli soldiers in Wichita Gardens, and soon after, catch and kill the head of the Sundaco family, Polly Sundaco, as he was attempting to make his way back to Las Venturas. You idiot! That's Tony Cipriani! Get him! While their enemies were now weakened, the Leones remained in a very precarious situation, and to add to Salvatore's stress, rumors began circulating that the Yakuza intended to take advantage of the weakened families and take over all assets across the city. I hear that the fucking Yakuza are gonna make a play to take over the city. Other than that, everything is just peace. Tony would initially attempt to cripple the strengthening Yakuza by destroying their military hardware, but out of sheer luck, he was eventually contacted by the wife of the Yakuza boss, Toshiko Kaysen. This man I want you to destroy is my husband, Kazuki Kasen. Don't worry, for your services, you will be handsomely rewarded. Toshiko, who had become increasingly estranged by her husband, Yakuza Wakagashira Kazuki Kaysen, decided to contact and hire Cipriani to ruin and eventually kill her husband, something Tony was all too happy to do, as it conveniently solved the Yakuza issue for the Leones. Tony would steal a Yakuza arms shipment, destroy couriers transporting Yakuza money, and even take Toshiko on a very public date to the opera, to further humiliate Kazuki. Tony would ultimately confront Kazuki atop his casino, where he put the disgraced warrior down for good. It is fitting that I kill you myself. You too, leave us. I am going to enjoy thrusting my sword into you. Yeah, I heard that about you. His obligation fulfilled, Tony would return to Toshiko, only to witness her suicide, guilty for her betrayal of Kazuki. I've been granted. Everything I asked for. Now, I just ask to be true, free. Goodbye, Tony san. Tony would also be contacted again by Donald Love, 
now living in abject poverty at the Flophouse in Pike Creek. Donald would propose an ambitious project of redeveloping the Ferrelli-controlled Fort Staunton area for the Panlantic Construction Company. I know what you're thinking, don't you? How the mighty have fallen. But this is just a temporary blip, my man. Okay. Oh, don't be all touchy. I know I said some nasty things about this being your fault and all, but hubris is a nasty, nasty bedfellow. Almost as nasty as termites. And trust me, I've tried both recently. Wait. You and me are on our way back. I never went away. We're in this together, amigo. No, we're not. Please. Please? Please? Forget about it, buddy. It's all your fault? Pathetic. Ten percent. Ten percent of what? This? Oh, you're too kind. Not of this. Of something really big. Come. I'll tell you about it on the drive. I hope you have your car. Mine's in the, uh, uh, shop. In order to yeah. pull off this move, Donald would get Tony's help in eliminating his ex-mentor, real estate mogul Avery Carrington, who had already secured the deal with Panlantic. After disposing of Carrington and obtaining the plans for love, Tony would also be forced to find and kill Ned Burner, who'd witnessed Carrington's murder and taken photos. All too happy to pay Burner back for his previous deception, Tony would silence the sleazy reporter and then deliver both his and Carrington's bodies to Donald's personal aircraft. What he needed them for, we can only speculate. Tony, I've been dying for this party. Just like my guests. With the Yakuza dealt with, and the Sundakos still reeling from the loss of their boss, Tony would contact Leone associate Eightball and pay for a series of explosives intended to decimate the Ferrelli presence in Liberty, and simultaneously free up the land needed for the Panlantic deal. Using the still under construction Porter Tunnel roads, Tony would strategically plant Eightball's explosives throughout the access tunnels under Fort Staunton and with a single press of a button, level the entire district. With Salvatore's trial coming up, Tony would perform one last task for Love. Defending him from the Colombian cartel, eager to siphon off Donald's funds in exchange for silence, on his bloody buy-in to the company. Cipriani would safely deliver Donald to his personal hangar, where Love temporarily fled the city, with the bodies of Ned Burner and Avery Carrington still aboard. Following Love's departure, Tony would aid in defending Salvatore's convoy en route to the courthouse from attacking Sicilians, fearing Leone would be released. And rightfully so, as the Leone boss would be found not guilty and allowed to return to his home in St. Mark's after Tony successfully defended his convoy. We cleaned it up with the Pirellis, the Sindacos we sent into the fucking sea. Now I got the Sicilians on the phone wanting peace. We all want peace. But my peace, not their fucking peace. I'm the big man now. No chump in the old country's gonna tell me what to do. Whilst the Sicilians would first attempt to broker a truce following Salvatore's release, Leone would refuse, wishing only to settle things on his terms. Tony and Salvatore would make their way to the mayor's office intent on discussing Salvatore's charges being dropped but would arrive just barely too late. Lousy bastards have taken him already! The two would shoot their way through the Sicilian goons before witnessing Massimo Torini taking off in a speedboat with Mayor O'Donovan hostage. After a lengthy chase through the waterways of the city, the two would corner Torini at Portland Rock and rescue the mayor before Tony personally shot down Torini's helicopter, finally putting an end to the conflict with the old country. Torini, it figures! Give him up! The mayor is mine! This city is mine! Salvatore, Sicily never wanted Christos Kipo di Città. But when tribute dried up, what could we do? It was nothing personal. Nothing personal? After what you put me through, I'm gonna tear your fucking heart out! Mr. Mayor, we just saved you from a bunch of crazed Sicilians. Yeah, thanks. And that means... Uh, the, uh, city is, uh, grateful to you? Ow! Try again. 
that you work for me, right? Oh, yeah, uh, that I work for you. Good. Now, don't call us, we'll call you. Get out of here, prick. Thank you, Mr. Leone. Tony, we did it. We run things now, you and me. We're a team, huh? Now, I just need you to do one small thing for me. I got some problems that I've been dealing with. Salvatore, Tony, and Mero Donovan would all return to Leone's mansion, where Sal made it clear who was in charge going forward, before meeting with Salvatore's uncle of the Sicilian Mafia to confirm the peace forced by Leone victory. Ah, Salvatore. All we really wanted was clarity. Yes, Uncle, I appreciate that. So, we are at peace now, you and the old country. Of course, me and all my people. Good. Very good. <laughs> For the next three years, the Leone family would remain the dominant organized crime family under Salvatore's leadership. Tony would at some point be promoted to Salvatore's capital regime and become the second in command for the entire family, even above Sal's own son, Joey. During this time, Tony would spend most of his time at his mama's restaurant in St. Mark's, preferring to have soldiers take care of work for him after many decades of putting in his time as a grunt. Tony would briefly hire criminal handyman Claude after meeting him through Joey Leone, but be just as helpless as anyone else in preventing the outcome of Claude's involvement in the family. Sometime in 2001, while leaving Luigi's Sex Club 7, Salvatore would be gunned down by the Reaper Man, but it isn't clear what became of Tony's role in the family following the Don's death. Tony Cipriani is in many respects an archetype of Italian-Americans many are all too familiar with. He is loyal to his friends and family, both blood and criminal, and willing to do just about anything asked of him by those who show him respect. He is easily irritated and won't hesitate to flip passerbys the bird, or mock those he slaughters for profit, and he can become very violent at a moment's notice. It is perhaps family that is the single strongest motivator for Cipriani, as he was doggedly determined to prove his mother wrong even in the face of her calling for him to be killed, and on numerous occasions put his own life at risk to save his boss Salvatore Leone, who had served as a father figure for Tony since his father's death at a young age. He has also been shown to take generational respect for one's elders very seriously, as evidenced by his disdain for the sleazy and disrespectful Vincenzo Chile. Is that your mother on the phone? Sure. You're disgusting. Where's your respect? Whilst capable of emotionally investing in those he cares for, Tony is equally as capable of performing heinous, violent acts on anyone who doesn't fall into his personal circle of protection. Butchering Giovanni Casa and chopping him into small pieces, or literally destroying an entire neighborhood just to wipe out his rivals. Whilst family remains evidently important to Tony, like most Americans, criminals especially, he is also easily motivated by money, and was even seemingly offended with Salvatore when his payment following the Leone takeover was substantially less than he'd anticipated. Shame on you. Come in. You're a good kid, <laughs> but shame on you. During his most prominent time as a mover during the height of the city's mob wars, Tony Cipriani was a relatively thin but burly Caucasian man with brown eyes and short dark brown hair. He sported a constant 5 o'clock shadow and was considerably taller than many of his associates, estimated to be roughly 6 foot. By 2001, when the Leone family began working with Claude, Tony had aged considerably. He appeared to have gained significant weight likely due to living at home since 1998 and eating in his mother's restaurant, as well as had a shift in tone of voice and slight change of hair color. He's best been known to wear stereotypically Italian-American clothing, and was most often seen wearing a dark brown jacket, tan pants, and black shoes, until becoming capital regime of the Leone family, where he usually wore a purple coat and tan dress pants. As a very prominent actor for Liberty City's most powerful Mafia family, the criminal record obtained by the LCPD for this program of Anthony Cipriani is extensive, as has so far always been the case with the subjects of this series. 
However, Cipriani may have them all beat. Nearly single-handedly responsible for making the Leone family as successful as it was in its heyday, and personally responsible for destroying the entire neighborhood of Fort Staunton, it is the opinion of our staff here at Grand Theft Autobiographies that Mr. Cipriani is perhaps the most psychopathic criminal we've yet covered, with the possible exception of his own boss's killer, Claude. All this being said, let's have a look at how this American wise guy stacks up to his criminal colleagues. Killing a made man from a rival mafia family. Forcing a reluctant drug dealer to do deals again. Killing three members of the Sindaco family in retaliation for killing the dealer. Killing several members of the Sindaco family to free J.D. O'Toole from under their control so that he could work for the Leone family, and stealing their car for J.D. Saving three of Vincenzo Chili's men from the LCPD after a failed raid on a petrol station. Picking up a car full of drugs for Vincenzo, escaping from the LCPD, and destroying the car in retaliation for Vincenzo's betrayal. Driving J.D. to collect the money he owes him from prostitutes, and killing some of their clients that become hostile. Driving Salvatore Leone away from Polly's review bar before it gets raided by the LCPD. Killing the Sindacos preparing to attack the Leone family casino in St. Mark's with cars rigged with bombs. The destruction of the doll's house. Killing several triads to prove himself to his mother. Winning an illegal street race against Dan Succo, and killing him afterwards to prove his worth. Killing Giovanni Casa and selling his remains disguised as meat for cooking. Killing the hitman sent after him by his mother. Attempting to bribe Jane Hopper so that she would allow Salvatore to use the docks. Dropping prostitutes off of the docks to win the workers for Salvatore's side. Scaring three union bosses so they would allow Salvatore to use the docks. Killing Jane Hopper's chauffeur, stealing his uniform to pose as him, and scaring Hopper by driving dangerously so that she would finally allow Salvatore to use the docks. Being Maria Latour's getaway driver after she steals from several shops. Taking Maria to meet her drug dealer and killing the Sindacos who kidnap her. Taking part in an illegal bike race. Killing Cedric Wayne, father and gay, for beating Maria. Overseeing a drug deal with Miguel and the Colombian cartel before escaping from the LCPD with a car full of drugs. Killing the Sindacos who kidnapped Salvatore. Helping Salvatore kill all the Sindacos in Red Light District. Following Massimo Torini and witnessing his meetings with the Diablos and Triads. Disposing of J.D. O'Toole's body. Killing Vincenzo Chili and all his henchmen who attempted to murder him. Helping the Leones kill the Diablos attacking their turf in Hepburn Heights and the Red Light District. Killing several Triads who attempted to destroy Salvatore's money stash at a warehouse. Helping Salvatore escape when the mayor threatens to make him responsible for all the problems happening in Liberty City. Killing Mayor Roger C. Hole. Stealing a hearse with a body on its way to the pathology labs for Don Love. Killing at least two van drivers to prevent them from getting any more marginal voting areas for Miles O'Donovan. Killing Miles O'Donovan's campaigners. Destroying the ballots factory guarded by the Ferrelli family. Killing several Ferrelli hitmen who attempted to assassinate Donald Love. Attempting to falsify the votes for the mayoral election in Love's favor. Killing several men who attempt to kill him, Salvatore, and the Mayor Hole's assistant. Killing several members of the Ferrelli family who ambushed Salvatore. Remote controlling Polly Sindaco's car into killing several Ferrellis. Killing a man who was going to inform Franco Ferrelli that the Sicilian Mafia is behind the war between the three families. Killing numerous Sindacos with help from Leon McCaffrey. Luring several Ferrellis into a trap where they are killed by him and the Ardens. Killing 20 Ferrellis in Belleville Park with a katana sword. Killing numerous Sindacos attempting to reclaim their turf in Northwood from the Ardens. Destroying several Ferrelli trucks transporting weapons. Killing an informant and retrieving the files for Ned Burner before they fall into the hands of the FBI. Killing several gang members and stealing their loot for Ned Burner. Stealing a fire truck and using it to cause mayhem in the streets. Killing DBP, Black Lightman, and Faith W. Stealing a van with evidence linking Donald Love to the Leone family. And killing Miles O'Donovan's men guarding it. Helping the Southside Hoods to kill numerous Ferrelli soldiers and take over Wichita Gardens. Killing Polly Sindaco. Destroying the Yakuza's weapon depot and tank, and killing several Yakuza members guarding them. Killing Avery Carrington and his Colombian cartel guards in order to steal his architectural plans of developing Fort Staunton for Donald Love. Killing Ned Burner and stealing the evidence of him and Love killing Carrington. Stealing two hearses with the bodies of Avery Carrington and Ned Burner for Love. Stealing a Yakuza weapon shipment for Toshiko Kaysen and Phil Cassidy. Destroying several vans transporting money from Kazuki Kaysen's casino. Killing several Ferrellis who attacked him and Toshiko. Killing Kazuki Kaysen and his guards. The destruction of Fort Staunton. Killing numerous members of the Colombian cartel attacking Donald Love's mansion. Killing several members of the Sicilian Mafia attempting to kill Salvatore on his way to court to stand trial. Killing Massimo Torini and his men on the Portland Rock alongside Salvatore in order to rescue Mayor Miles O'Donovan. Robbing a laundry under the triad's protection. Hiring Claude to destroy three laundry vans. Hiring Claude to steal a briefcase from the triads. Hiring Claude to kill three triad warlords. Hiring Claude to destroy the Triad's fishing factory with a truck rigged with a bomb. 
In the end, when the destruction of Fort Staunton is added to the tallies, the estimate for Cipriani's murders alone easily surpasses all other subjects we've yet examined on this series, and likely many more to come. Whilst loyal to those he cared about, Tony's absolute indifference to the deaths of likely thousands of people, mostly innocent Italian-American civilians, demonstrates his utterly ruthless mafia mentality. There is perhaps no man in the history of Liberty City's criminal underworld to have as long-lasting an effect as Mr. Tough Guy himself, Anthony Cipriani. America is a dangerous place, people. Once again, demonstrated in abundance tonight with the horrifying power these organized criminals exert over our supposedly fair justice system, and yet skirt the full punishment of the law. Mind your manners when you eat at your next Liberty City Italian restaurant, people. The owners just might be former heads of the Mafia. I'll see you next time on Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker.